Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Welcome back. Uh, this is lecture four, and uh, I would first briefly uh, remind you of the topics that we had been thinking about about biosensors. And the topic of today's discussion would be the shape of a surface. So I'll recap the lecture three, remind you what we had been talking about. And then we'll talk about the shape of an object described by fractals. Now the word fractals may frighten you. Don't worry, I'll explain it very simply. And then I'll talk about regular fractals followed by when a surface is randomly structured but still defined by a single number. I will end with the outline of the course because then we'll really get started from the lake next year onward. You see, you may remember from the last lecture that although there are wide variety of sensors, but once you sort of arrange them in some sort of shape according to their shape, the planar sensors are far less sensitive compared to nanowire or cylindrical sensors. Other sensors having complicated shape, for example, here is a collection of nanowires or a parallel collection of array of nanowires that has response somewhere in between. And we wanted to know what is it in the geometry of this structure that gives rise to this extraordinary sensitivity of nanobiosensors. Now, of course, we tried immediately to see whether the surface to volume ratio, that argument, that molecule surrounding a nanoware giving extraordinary sensitivity, that fell flat. Because although we were able to explain why the sensitivity goes up by a certain amount, let's say a factor of five or so, when you make the nanoware diameter small, so that's good, a factor of five is nothing to sneeze about, but that really didn't explain the extraordinary sensitivity gain of nanobiosensors. And I told you that the real secret lies in how a jellyfish catches its food. So, and it uses the same aspect of geometry. That's the shape of the geometry in order to catch the food. And that is what we are going to discuss next. And we'll call it geometry of diffusion. Why I use this term, you will know in a few minutes. Now, if you have taken a geometry class in, uh, in, in high school, then your teacher may have channeled Euclid to tell you a surface is two-dimensional, a line is one-dimensional, and a point is a zero-dimensional object. Now, of course, you may not have questioned him or her, because it seems so obvious. But think about it for a second. If you had instead a collection of disks, nano dots of some sort, randomly scattered on a surface, or a collection of sticks or nano wires, for example, in that case, what dimension would the surface actually be? It's neither a planar surface, because the whole thing isn't covered, nor it is a single line. So therefore, is the surface, definition of the surface, completely undefined in this case? It turns out that's really not the case. You can immediately, let me show you how it works. Let's take a same surface and put it in a set in a grid. Now you see when you have a surface that are arranged, it's a planar surface, if you divide it by a factor of two, then in a surface, all four cells will be occupied. In a line, only two of the four will be occupied. And for a dot, this green dot, only one of them occupied. Divide it one more time, all occupied on the surface, only four occupied in the line, and still the single one occupied in this uh, for a dot. And therefore, if you keep doing it, you will soon get the idea that the number of, as you keep dividing, the number of cells occupied is, goes as h squared. h squared is the division. 
it goes linearly with h for a line and it goes h to the power 0 which is by the way I hope you remember that's 1 because it's always one cell that gets occupied. So that is goes to as h to the power 0. So now you can immediately see that if you plot the log of h as a function of log over 1 over h in this, you will immediately see that this will be fractal dimension, the slope would be, slope of this line will give you the fractal dimension for a surface, that for a line, and that for a dot. So, because the dot doesn't change, the occupation doesn't change, in the blue line it changes linearly, for the surface it changes as a square. As a result, you can immediately see why a surface should be two-dimensional, a line one-dimensional, and a dot a zero-dimensional object. Now, this recipe immediately tells us how to think about a random collection of sticks or nanowires or nanodots for example. But before I get there, let me tell you how to think about a, a surface which is slightly more ordered. We'll call that a regular fractal. Consider a line shown here in the red and then let's take out one third of it. Then of the remaining two pieces, the red pieces, let's divide it into two, three and then take out the middle piece, here and here. And let's keep doing it. If you keep doing it, the residual surface or the residual line is not a full line, nor is it a full dot, it's not a single dot, and therefore the fractal dimension of this surface will be somewhere between 0 and 1. So let's calculate again. So if you divide it into one third, then n will be 2 because only 2 are taken, the 1 is thrown out. If you divide it into 9 pieces, then 4 will be occupied, 27, 8 will be occupied, and then in general, if h goes as 1 over t to the power n, the number of cells occupied will be 2 to the power n. Again, you can calculate the fractal dimension simply by log, taking the log of this, log of these quantities, and once you have done that, you will see the dimension of this fractured line is only 0.63. It is not 1, not 0, but somewhere in between. Now, in general, you get the rule. The rule is divide things in n pieces and keep m pieces. And if you keep doing it over and over again, the surface you will create is, will be the fractal dimension of the corresponding surface. The log of the ratios, ratio of the logs will give you the fractal dimension of the surface. Now this is a line, no sensor is actually just a single line, rather most sensors are surfaces. So what about fractal dimension of a surface? In order to know the fractal, or oh, before I get there, uh, you see, in order to uh, create this fractal surface, these surfaces, you don't have to throw out a predetermined pieces. For example, if you divide it into four, you can throw away the middle two and keep throwing away the middle two of the residual pieces. That way create one surface, that will be fine. That will have a certain fractal dimension, log of four and do, uh, on, on, in the denominator, log of two in the numerator. But you could also have done something quite different. You could have taken the four pieces, but instead of throwing away just the middle two, you could throw away the first and third and keep doing this, first and third, first and third. And by doing that, you can also create a surface that have follows the same algorithm and therefore has the frame, same fractal dimension, but they don't look the same at all. Now, if these two examples we'll call regular fractal where you're following the same rule over and over again. But of course, you could have followed a random rule that in the first, first iteration you can throw away the middle two, in the next iteration you can throw away the first and third, first and third, and therefore keep mixing up the rules, but so long you keep the same number of pieces and out of 
the total number of pieces that you originally divided the line with, it will be good. So therefore, these surfaces will be called a random fractal and the two before that I showed will be called a regular fractal. And so therefore, fractal surfaces need not be unique and they can be either regular or irregular. Now let's talk about surfaces. Same rules once again. Let's say you divide the whole surface by stripes. Initially, you divide the whole surface into groups of three. Throw away the middle piece. Then of the remaining piece, you throw away the middle piece and keep the remaining ones and iterate the process. What is the fractal dimension of this surface? The fractal dimension of this surface, you can again divide it into one third and count how many red lines or dead stripes you have in this structure. So in the beginning, when you divide it into only three, you will have six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six boxes will be occupied. Then you will, if you divide it into nine pieces on either side, then you will have 36. Count it up. It should be a good exercise and you'll be able to see how it works out. And very soon you will see that when h goes as 1 to the power 3 to the power n, the total number will go as 3 to the power n multiplied by 2 to the power n. And once you calculate the fractal dimension, what you will see, the fractal dimension is 1, because it is uniform in this direction, plus the fractal dimension along this line, and which is in the previous, from the previous example was 0.63. So the fractal dimension of this surface is 1.63. In general, you don't have to follow exactly the same rules. As I mentioned before, that fractal, regular fractals comes in wide variety of forms. So for example, this surface is exactly the same as the other surface because now you have sort of striped on the horizontal axis. Previously, you did it on the vertical axis and in fact, in both cases, the fractal dimension would be exactly the same. Now, what about this fractal structure, random collection of rods? Does it have anything to do with these fractals? Can it have exactly the same fractal dimension as the other two? Let's find out. So here I have redrawn a set of nanowares, for example, on a surface, which will eventually become a nanobiosensors. Biomolecules will be attached to the nanowares themselves, but we'll get to that later on. So again, let's start by following the rules. Divide it into two, two pieces, and once you do, you see all four are actually occupied in this particular case because there's nanowares in each one of those boxes. Now, if you keep doing it, keep dividing it, very soon you will find that there will be boxes which are no longer occupied. And so the box number will not go as h square, but will go at somewhat slower rate because there will be empty boxes. And you could keep doing it. And as you keep doing it, then there will be more and more number, but the number will not go as h square but somewhere less than h square. And in this case, you can show that the fractal dimension of this nanotube network is 1.54. It is neither completely two-dimensional nor one-dimensional, but somewhere in between. And this fractal dimension will play a great role in the story that I'm going to tell you. Now, in many cases, what you'll find it useful that when you have a random surface like this, instead of handling the random surface directly, what we should do is convert it to an equivalent regular surface. Because you see, equivalent regular surface will be much easier to analyze and handle and we'll be able to do mathematics on it. That will be difficult. That would have been difficult otherwise. So how do we get from the irregular to a regular surface? Very simple. You remember that we have already mentioned for the regular surface with stripes, 
the d fractal dimension of the regular surface is 1 plus log m plus divided by log m. Let us say this particular surface has a fractal dimension of 1.54. Previous slide we saw that is 1.54, but here let us assume that is approximately 1.5. Now let, let's make m is equal to 2. So the number of pieces we are going to keep is 2. We can put m in here, d I know is 1.5. So once I solve it, I will get n is equal to 4. And once I get n equals 4, I can now generate the equivalent surface. I will draw a line segment. I will draw a line segment cut it up into four pieces, throw away the middle two. Then again, of the remaining, cut it up into four pieces, throw the remaining two and keep doing this. And once I have done this, then this, the surface I have created, has exactly the same surface property as the original irregular surface. And this equivalence is will be very important when you see how biomolecules get captured on these surfaces. So with this information now, let me tell you the outline of the course, because now we have all the three pieces that we needed to know in place. We know why nanobiosensors are important. We know the types of biomolecules that we are interested in, DNA, protein, glucose, and similar type of uh, and viruses and bacteria. And we now know that the geometry of the surfaces can be described by fractals and there are three types of sensors we are interested in, potentiometric, amperometric and cantilever. With this basic information, now we can check out the outline of the course. The first part of the course has to do with how long the biomolecule takes in order to reach the sensor surface. It cannot get there instantaneously because it is diffusing around, randomly walking around and so there is a time necessary before it can reach the sensor surface. The lower the density of biomolecules, longer it will be before a certain number can find its way to the sensor surface. And that information is captured here. Rho naught is the density of the target. Ts is the average time needed for the molecules to get to the sensor surface. And df is a fractal dimension of the sensor itself. And we will find that these informations are all connected up. Lower the density, longer the time one needs in order to sense something. Now this fundamental relationship will tell us that regardless of how sensor sensitive the sensor is, there is a fundamental lower limit, the diffusion limit, which dictates what is the minimum density one can detect by using a specific sensor. Now this relationship might remind you of Heisenberg's principle where the energy and the time are also related to a constant. If you want to measure something with a high precision, then you must allow for longer time. If you want to measure a low density, you must allow for longer duration. You must wait for long before you can declare that the analyte is present or not. Now this result is technology agnostic. It doesn't matter whether you are using amperometric sensor, potentiometric sensor, or even a cantilever spin sensor, it doesn't matter. Rather, this is a general principle that applies to all biosensors. Now next, from lecture 11 to 22, we'll talk about when the biomolecules have finally landed on the sensor surface, how does the sensor respond? Now in this case, of course, Amperometric sensors are very different from potentiometric sensors or cantilever based sensors. The physics of the sensor matters and that will spend some time in thinking through the issues clearly. And in that case, we'll think about primarily the, how the sensor responds to the intrinsic properties 
of the biomolecules, namely the mass of the biomolecule. You may remember bacteria are heavy, and whereas wire or DNA and glucose are actually very light. And so depending on the intrinsic property of the biomolecule, we'll be using different sensors to detect them. Now we'll also at that point, we'll discuss the noise limit associated with detection because in a noisy environment, a sensor may not be able to tail apart between a molecule that is target molecule which has actually landed versus a random fluctuation in the sensor characteristics. Geometry of the sensor will again play a very important role as we will see. And finally, we'll talk about one of the most important but often most misunderstood aspect of sensing and that has to do with selectivity. You see, if two molecule comes in and lands on the sensor, so a target molecule and a P for parasitic molecule, meaning some molecule that you really don't want to detect. In that case, if both of them trigger the same response in the sensor surface, then it really doesn't matter how sensitive the sensor is or how fast it can detect it. In fact, this sensor is completely useless because it's not selective to the molecule that we are interested in. And it turns out that this problem of selectivity can be defined as a signal to noise ratio problem. So this T is the signal, P is the noise. And we'll see the theories of information, the information theory, the various uh, results of the information theory will be directly relevant. Also will be relevant are the fundamental issues with random sequential absorption, that how these molecules essentially arrange themselves on the surface. And that will be lectures 22 to 30. So therefore, what you will see a key and repeating or recurring aspect of the, in this course is the essence or essential role geometry plays. Geometry plays a significant role in defining the sensitivity limit. It defines the screening, how the molecules arranges themselves around the sensor. And it defines the selectivity that some molecules which are the target molecules, let's say blue, and the green molecules, let's say these are parasitic molecules, how they arrange themselves and what the signal to noise ratio would be is again defined by the geometry of the surfaces as well as geometry of the molecule. And you will see in nanobiosensors in particular, this role of geometry, surface geometry is fundamental and we'll find that over and over again in various contexts. So let me conclude then. I tried to tell you in the beginning that the surface to volume ratio is often used to describe a sensor surface or a sensor response but it really doesn't work in terms of interpreting the dramatic grain in sensitivity. In instead, what we'll see, what we have discussed is that if you characterize the sensor surface with fractal dimension, that will turn out to be far more powerful. The second aspect regarding fractals I wanted to mention was that you can have a regular fractal where the elements are generated by a set set of rules, a given set of rules, or you can mix it up. And in that case, it can have a random surface, like a random collection of nanowares, that's again described by a fractal's dimension. And you can go back and forth between them, and that will ease analysis. And finally, I mentioned that the course is arranged in a way that will discuss three fundamental topics associated with nanobiosensing. One is settling time. How long do you have to wait before you have a signal? The second was sensitivity, that once the molecule lands, how sensitive is the sensor so that it can respond to it? How many molecules on the minimum do you need before you have a good signal to noise ratio? And finally, one of the most important is selectivity. Can the sensor tail apart between the target and the parasitic molecules? And that is how the course is arranged. So we'll get started in that from the next lecture.
So until next time, then take care.